Um, yeah, thanks a lot for um, sacrificing an hour of your precious time to come along. Um, so I think I know most people here. My name's James Donald. I'm, um, I'm sorry. Uh, normally when we have extra people, we introduce them and internal people, we don't. Oh, that's and all right. You're seen as an internal person. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I kind of, I feel like a... I do notice that you have some strange university. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that must have been a, a typo. <clears throat> um, anyway, these things happen. But um, yeah, I feel very much, I guess, um, connected um, and a part of this group. So I think I know most people here, but um, for formality, um, I'm third year, in my third year of the PhD and I'm technically enrolled at the ANU, but um, I live in Sydney and Paul is my supervisor who's here. So um, I, I, that's why I know most people and spend a fair bit of time here. Um, and um, yeah, it's a real um, privilege to be able to um, present my work today. Basically, I'm going to um, present the guts of my PhD uh, so far um, today um, and um, we'll see how we go. Um, so yeah, mindfulness and coping with stress. <coughs> um, so I've got a, a kind of a long-term personal interest in mindfulness and I've kind of seen how it helps um, me personally kind of dealing with things like a PhD. Um, or not, as the case may be. Um, and before um, starting the PhD, I worked in the government for seven years. And I guess just over that time, working on several budgets and seeing kind of the, the dynamics of fairly stressful um, work environments have had an interest in how people kind of deal with those kind of um, chronic and acute kind of stresses. Um, so I chose to focus my PhD research on, on that. Um, what, most of what I'm going to present today is not focused on the workplace, just because of kind of um, practicalities of data collection and so on. I ended up doing more sort of basic research, but my interest is very much in kind of workplace stress. So a bit of a um, quick um, overview of what I'm going to cover. One and two are, are basically background on stress, um, the cost of stress and coping with stress, um, much of which you'll be familiar with. And then um, the research, um, and I'm going to present two field studies and um, one lab study um, and hopefully squeeze all that into an hour or a bit less than an hour. So just a bit of context around um, um, stress and um, mental stress related to um, work, um, you know, there's, there's kind of growing evidence that <clears throat> mental stress um, is a significant burden um, on our society and on organisations um, in particular. Um, so this is a little old now, but showing that the blue bit showing that, you know, about a third of um, workers' compensation claims are attributed to um, uh, mental stress. And the other third is basically physical and then a bunch of other things. Um, so it's a significant issue in the workplace. A um, couple of other interesting um, facts and figures. Uh, there was, this, uh, I guess, a some estimates done a few years ago um, now on the costs of work-related mental stress to the economy um, and the estimate was just around $15 billion and that's, that was at the time about 1.5% of Australia's GDP which makes it kind of, I guess puts it in context um, that it's a significant cost to not just organisations but flow on um, in terms of productivity and people taking extended leave of absence and, um, and so on. <clears throat> um, and then this is another kind of um, interesting sort of contextual stat from the ABS that um, <clears throat> they found that around 70% of workers who reported they experienced work-related st um, stress, mental stress, didn't apply for workers' compensation. So those, um, th those previous um, results back here were basically based on people who were actually reporting um, that they were suffering from various kinds of stress-related um, illness in the workplace, whereas a whole chunk of people simply don't report. And that, I guess, is pretty um, intuitive, you know, self-employed people and small businesses and that kind of thing. They just don't have the resources to, um, to deal with this. <clears throat> so, um, and I guess these costs obviously spill over into, um, into people's lives. And, 
and, and people um, resort to a whole range of different ways of coping with these demands. Um, and uh, this is just a basically comparison of the, the, the market, size of the market of um, uh, psychotropic drugs in Australia um, in, over the last decade, or 2000, 2011. And you can see there's, I mean, the size of the pies are um, reflective of the size in the, in the growth. And these are rates, so it's per thousand um, head of population. So the rates of um, consumption of these you know, drugs is increased significantly over the, the decade. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, particularly, you can see antidepressants are kind of making up the lion's share of that, um, but also anti-anxiety medications, which I guess is relevant to stress. Um, and then in the US, again, I guess this is, most of this is pretty common knowledge, but it's still pretty sobering when you think about a quarter of women um, you know, basically <clears throat> using mental health medications on a regular basis. And um, you can see that sort of steady increase over the decade again. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, this is one way, obviously, of, um, of, of mitigating the effects of, of the demands of a stressful um, life and people that are struggling to deal with those demands. Um, but against that backdrop, uh, we have this. Um, and <clears throat> so 2003 was the, the smaller um, issue um, of time and basically that was kind of, that's often talked about as being the moment when kind of meditation kind of went mainstream in a way, when time acknowledged that it was, there's some decent evidence behind it. And then a decade later last year was the mindful revolution. Um, so, <clears throat> um, there's been a real explosion in um, interest in mindfulness and obviously some people have criticised it. I read a paper recently that was called Muck Mindfulness um, and there's kind of a bit of that um, but uh, as I'll I guess argue today I think there's a, a there's obviously there's good um, now research evidence for the efficacy of this and there's a pretty um, compelling context that this has come from, the interest in this has come from. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of something um, actually from Paul um, in one of his presentations, but it's, um, it just shows the uh, um, exponential increase in research um, on mindfulness over the last couple of decades. Um, and the 2012 number was around just under 500, so that curve hasn't kind of plateaued out yet. Um, um, probably, surely will um, sometime, but um, it hasn't shown signs of doing that yet. So there's this real explosion in, in academic interest in mindfulness. <coughs> um, so, <coughs> um, what, what, what's the basic kind of um, research? I, ge I guess, um, I mean, there's there's been, literally been thousands of studies done, and um, most of that work has been done on phys physiological um, symptoms and um, on mental health and, and well-being, sort of affective outcomes. Um, and so this was a big meta-analysis done a couple of years ago, um, and this is what it concluded, that there's a clear convergence of findings, um, all of which suggest that mindfulness is positively associated with psychological health and training in mindfulness may bring about positive psychological effects. And these were the kinds of interventions here that were included, around 65 of them in this particular meta-analysis. Um, okay. Yes? Can you define mindfulness? Sure thing. Um, I haven't actually got a slide defining mindfulness on here. I probably should have. Um, <laughs> but um, I have many in other slide packs that I, that I have, but um, essentially the, the sort of classic definition that's given in academic research is um, John Kabat-Zinn, which is um, you know, contacting the present moment in a way that's um, you know, intentional, um, that's um, uh, present, and that's non-judgmental or accepting of um, whatever's showing up in the present moment. So. Um, that's probably the, the most sort of widely used definition. There are others that have been developed since. Um, 
So, um, Do all of these studies uh, define mindfulness in the same way and measure it in the same way? Um, no, 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 definitely not. There's, um, as I guess a few people, many people who study mindfulness will know there are a range of scales and they, they differ, um, <clears throat> I guess, with um, some of them focusing more on attention, like the mass through to more acceptance um, and then the act. I guess model includes other aspects of mindfulness as well, like self as context and other things. So, um, uh, yeah. So, um, I guess this is um, th these are looking at, at, at different protocols, uh, dif different actual mindfulness interventions. So, and the and, and, and effects on depression and a whole range of affective outcomes. Um, I should have said at the beginning to please. Um, ask questions as we go as well. So if Sorry. anyone wants to, yeah, it's a good, it's a good um, point. So um, I'll carry on, but yeah, please do chip in if you have any other questions or you see anything that I've um, obviously missed, including in the presentation. Um, but kind of against this backdrop, um, there's far less evidence for the effort, the effects of mindfulness interventions um, on behavioural responses um, to, to, to stress um, in particular. Um, like for example, there are no meta-analyses that I've been able to find at least, or even systematic reviews of research on um, the effect of mindfulness interventions on, on behaviour, um, observable behaviours. Like most of the work is on um, affect, um, in, measured in obviously a whole range of different ways. Um, so, um, I guess this is something that's, um, that, yeah, this is basically the sort of, I guess, point of departure for my research and um, I've focused on that, um, that basic link between mindfulness and, and behavioural responses to stress. So, I want to do a quick exercise, uh, yeah, um, sure. talking about the affect versus behavioural response, a lot of the affect is pretty close to behavioral response, but it's actually just self-report. And so, uh, are you talking about behavioral response that's non-self-report, or are you talking about self-report or behavioral responses? Um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I guess, um, Certainly, non like non self report. There's limited work on that. But even like as I'll get into the coping literature, even work on coping, like the physical things that people are doing to respond to stressful um, uh, events. There, there's little work has been done on that as well. I mean, relative to the, the work that's done on self reports about how I'm feeling, like mood and anxiety and um, know, d depressive rumination and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I guess I'd make the distinction between um, self-reports of, of observable behaviour versus um, affect. Um, but I'm not saying there's no work. I'm definitely not saying that. It's just if you kind of compare them, there, there, there's, a, there's a clear difference. I mean, number of studies. I theory of planned behaviour sort of stuff uh, that I would have imagined there would be mindfulness people would be using that kind of model. Okay, I'm not, I'm not familiar okay. with that, but yeah, I've got something right. to check out. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so I want to just switch gears a little bit and then look at um, one kind of um, behavioural response, which is coping. Um, so there's a vast literature on coping, how people kind of respond to stressful events in their lives, the different kind of ways, and I'll define that in a minute. But I thought I'd just do a quick um, kind of personal exercise just to kind of change it up for a second. So um, I want you to just to think of your most stressful experience of the last month, okay? So that might be hard um, or it might be hard, uh, but just take a second to think of what you'd say was your most stressful experience. It might have been at work or with someone at home, um, might have been some bad news you got or argument or whatever. Um, and just think about um, how stressed this made you feel. And then think about how you responded to this situation. Like, what did you do? Did you just try and have a conversation with whoever it was? Or did you just accept it if it was bad news? Or did you 
um, just distract yourself with something else? Or did you maybe try and block it out and pretend it hadn't happened? Um, so just think about how you dealt with this. Um, and <clears throat> um, essentially, the way you dealt with it um, ha can be described as a coping response. Um, and this is a standard definition of coping given by Lazarus and Folkman, the, the kind of um, two key um, scholars in, in the coping literature. Constantly changing cognitive and behavioural efforts to manage demands that are appraised as taxing or exceeding the person's resources. So the sense in which there are demands and there's an appraisal that those demands are more than the kind of capacity I have to deal with them. And then coping is the kind of ways in which we kind of try and close that gap. Um, and I like this picture because I think it just highlights the fact that as humans we have kind of an incredible ability to find a way through um, and um, even in the kind of most dire of circumstances we have the ability to kind of somehow adapt and I guess that's what coping is trying to um, I guess study. Um, so there have been lots of efforts to try and classify coping responses. There are like more than 30,000 studies of coping over the last, you know, four decades or, or so. Um, it's a massive, basically messy field in many ways, just because it's just describing behaviour, you know. Like if, if I asked everyone here to describe the things they did to cope that you know you could fill probably the the board with with all the different things that we do how do you classify that um, <clears throat> one way is approach versus avoidance coping and that's um, probably one of the more um, researched or you know more used classifications of coping and that's what what I've used for my work um, so um, approach coping is described basically as cognitive and emotional activity uh, oriented toward a threat um, so anything that you did that kind of brought you in some way towards the threat, um, dealing with it, talking to someone about it, planning how to kind of solve it or whatever. Um, and <clears throat> um, conversely, avoidance is activity that's oriented away from the threat. So anything that you've done, that you did that took you away, um, not thinking about it, distracting yourself, etc., cetera, um, through the substance use and other things. So here's my, um, here are my representations of a gold star approach coper. And um, here's a, a handy avoidance coper. And I guess the point is that, um, you know, avoidance coping can be very adaptive. And these responses that we have are very contextual. They depend on the, on the circumstances. Like, for example, in the situation you just thought about, who would say they mostly used approach forms of coping response to kind of deal with, with uh, mostly approach, yep. Yeah. And who'd say they mostly used avoidance? Yeah, yep, yeah, more or less, yeah. And who'd say they used both, like kind of 50-50, yeah. So you kind of get this, this kind of messy kind of spread of ways in which people respond. But um, several meta-analyses have, have found that over the long term, people that use approach coping strategies um, you know, that predicts better mental health outcomes and the, the, the converse for people who tend to go for avoidance um, responses over the long term. If you go to avoidance continually, um, it predicts worse um, health outcomes. But wouldn't that be like any of the other things that uh, a lot of these approach avoidance sorts of things that the ability to pick and choose appropriately is probably better than uh, relying overly much on one or the other? Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, so, um, but, I, but I guess, yeah, over the long term, like, for example, like, yeah, if, if a person's going to the same strategy over and over again, then, yeah, it's, there's evidence that avoidance is, has negative outcomes, basically. Um, so then, in terms of what I've um, come up with as research 
questions. Um, so the first one is, does a person's level of mindfulness predict more approach and less avoidance coping um, with a stressful event? And um, um, are these effects independent of a person's um, affect and self-efficacy? So there's um, a fair bit of evidence that um, self-efficacy is a, is a strong predictor of, um, of coping. Um, the more self-efficacious you feel, the more likely you are to approach in a situation, uh, the less likely you are to avoid because um, you feel like you have the resources to bring to bear on the situation. You kind of know what to do, if something you've done before or situation that's familiar to you, for example. Um, and conversely, you know, um, if you're feeling very stressed, you're generally more likely to avoid because facing this thing is pretty difficult. Um, so basically I was looking at um, whether mindfulness predicts coping independent of these things. Um, and just again, bearing in mind, and this is a definite oversight, I should have included a definition of mindfulness, but like a key aspect of mindfulness is, the is changing the relationship that you have to what is otherwise a stressful situation. So does, does that kind of move of changing the relationship you have to a stressful experience matter? Or is it just how stressed you feel versus and how efficacious you feel? But wait, mindfulness. You can change the relationship by many manners, not just by mindfulness. Instead of avoiding, you could approach. Instead of watching TV, you could call a friend. So, and, and both of them would change the relationship? Or, or do you mean change the relationship in a specific manner? Um, the relationship between what? The, your relationship to the experience, as you were saying. Oh, I see. Yeah, I guess they could do. Um, um, <clears throat> so, for example, if you... I'm still trying to your, what mindfulness is. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, um, how about I keep going and look at how I've operationalised it? Perfect, thank you. And then that'll hopefully deal with the question which is the next slide. Um, so basically, for my work, I've drawn upon the ACT um, conceptualizations of mindfulness. Um, and um, uh, I wasn't going to go through them all, just in the interest of time. I can if people want to. But um, I, for my first two studies, I chose to focus on cognitive diffusion. So I mean, who's familiar with this? Who's seen this? many times before. I figured that m most people would be. Um, <clears throat> but essentially for those that haven't seen it, the top and the bottom and the left two um, descri uh, describe mindfulness processes in the ACT framework and the right two are about values. Um, and so for my first two, two studies I chose to focus on cognitive diffusion as a kind of a way of basically measuring an aspect of mindfulness. Um, and a definition there or a description of um, cognitive diffusion um, is distancing from thoughts so they have less control over a person's behaviour. Which ones are mindful? The whole thing is that mindful. No, the, the, the top and the bottom and the left two are generally seen to be um, mindfulness processes um, in the ACT kind of framework, the psychological flexibility framework. Um, and so cognitive diffusion describes, you know, it's as the name suggests, like if you're fused with your thoughts, like if you think of that, ex that example you just thought for yourself, like how caught up in your thoughts were you about that situation versus how much were you able to see them as just thoughts and have a little bit of distance or perspective, take a bit of perspective in relation to that. So this measures kind of like the relationship that you have with your thoughts and then in, in turn the extent to which those thoughts like, oh my God, this is the end of me or something, govern your behaviour versus don't. And maybe you might have, therefore, alternative ways of responding uh, rather than just to that thought, for example. So um, it's a measure of basically distancing from thoughts. Um, I don't know, if Paul, if you want to chip in at all as I go through, but... Um, yeah. We are going to get to acceptance in case you worry. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, so 
I'm just conscious of the time as well. Um, <clears throat> so basically the first study, um, I've got three and if I run out of time that's fine, I'll just cover two. But the first is um, looking at cognitive diffusion and coping with monthly setbacks. So we had 200 PhD students and staff from three Australian universities. And we basically, at three time points, about six weeks apart, we asked them to think about their most stressful event, just like we did now, just, just before, of the last month. Um, and um, up there's sort of a bit of a um, grab of a couple of people's responses and some of them were actually quite intense. In fact, they were much more intense than I was expecting. Um, uh, <clears throat> a lot seems to happen over a month for, for this group. Um, and we measured um, coping, approach and avoidance and that was a self-report measure um, using the COPE inventory. Um, and then we measured their cognitive diffusion in relation to this um, event, like how caught up they were in their thoughts about this event. Um, and uh, versus, you know, able to kind of get some distance and then how stressed this event made them feel. So um, we, um, with the help of, of Phil, um, been looking at um, a cross-lagged model um, where basically the red path is sort of the main path of interest and the blue are kind of the covariates. So we're looking at whether um, time one's cognitive diffusion predicted times two, time two's avoidance, uh, controlling for last period's avoidance and last period's stress appraisal. Um, so <coughs> we, um, th this data, these data were also collected as a part of an RCT, so we had to control for con experimental effects as well in this, but I haven't put that up on the, um, on the diagram just to make it simpler. Um, and so for time one to time two, we found that yes, um, cognitive diffusion la at time one predicted avoidance coping at time two, controlling for um, time one avoidance and time one stress. Um, but interestingly, the kind of reverse path was non-significant from avoidance one to diffusion two. Um, but in the... I see cognitive diffusion as a part of avoidance coping. I mean, I see that as one way of enacting avoidance uh, coping. Um, uh, if you look at the scales, they're, they're quite, and they're, they're, not, they're not highly correlated. Like, just to give you an, an, an example, like the avoidance coping scale of things like I pretended that it hadn't happened, so there's a measure of denial, I went to the movies, I, you know, talked to a friend, I, um, you know, just tried to stop thinking about it and that kind of thing, whereas the cognitive diffusion items are really about how sort of tied up in the thoughts you were rather than kind of what you did. Um, but yeah, in terms of the correlations that I uh, can't recall, but it wasn't, wasn't Kind of I, I, speak a, I, I think maybe it's, with the diffusion thing, I think sometimes it's more like think about believability. So you still have the thoughts. Yeah. It's about how believable you, you perceive the thoughts to be. So you have a sense of your thoughts as, as a passing thing uh, versus all my thoughts are 100% true. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, believe, believe in me. Exactly. It sounds almost more like a bit stressed. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be one way of but again, they weren't, high, they weren't concerningly highly correlated. Um, and then unfortunately we didn't, find, well just the fact is we didn't find uh, significant um, sort of uh, re replication from time two to time three. Um, so I'm not really quite sure why that is actually. Um, but time two to time three was getting towards the end of the semester, so it should have been more kind of a more stressful time of year. You'd expect that event stress and avoidance coping should be kind of Maybe more, um, more, more related, um, but <clears throat> that was kind of what we found from from this. But that's not that typical. Uh, if you uh, test time two and three without time one, you'll probably get the significant paths. Um, so it's just saying that uh, which, because you're already controlling for the time one measures, it gets it hard. It makes it harder to get the path from time two to time three. 
Okay. Um, at least a couple of times where I've looked at things like this yep. and had the same response, and I yep. just looked at the time two and time three, and then I got significant differences. So okay. it was controlling for the time one that knocked out those differences. And another way of looking at that is you're, those are looking at, uh, you could look at total effects. Right. Uh, okay. So these aren't total effects, these are direct no. effects. No, no. Mm. But and, yeah, okay. Um, I don't. I don't think it is because we because we we basically we had the kind of long diagonals as well in there originally, and we kind of. Um, controlling for time one because uh, the time two <coughs> measures are control for the time one. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. That's what a path model is. Yeah. So that would make sense. Your interpretation would make sense. Obviously. And Phil did it. You would do it that way. <laughs> Is that saying basically then that um, the fact that someone tends to be more or less fused or defused um, it would play out over the three time frames, but because you're controlling for the first one, then you're not going to find that effect later on? Possibly. Mm -hmm. It's not sequential though, isn't it? Like, I'm just interested because would that mean that our figures on the left are somewhat deflated relative to what they would otherwise be? Like, is the opposite true as well? That <coughs> if you controlled for time three, would the time one and two to fix? Well, I mean, <laughs> the model doesn't, the model runs in parallel. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to take so much time away from James here, but right. um, so why would it occur just for the first set of links and not say? Uh, I'm not saying it is. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that the effects that occur in the second links uh, might be there, but there's nothing new that hasn't already happened. So you're saying that it is good in sequential anymore? Yeah. Okay. Mm. But if they don't happen, then they are not important. Well, that's not necessarily true, because uh, if you test time two and three only, then you get significant yeah. effects. Oh, which means... Give me something to check. Time two is taking over to time one. Yeah. 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 I haven't 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 tested that just two and three um, so yeah no, no, thank you um, okay so then the second yeah yeah I mean the more you see and yeah, it's just clear there's no effect yeah. okay uh, well be keen to I guess talk about it offline. Um, so, um, in terms of the, the second study, it's basically the same data set, but we ask people to report the day's most stressful event over 20 days. So, a kind of a, a time uh, series um, study. And um, we took a bunch of measures there cognitive diffusion, stress perception, self efficacy all in relation to the day's most stressful event uh, and coping responses, um, either approach or avoid. Um, and basically, uh, again, with, with the, the help of Phil and also Jesse in terms of R, should acknowledge, um, the, <coughs> um, we, we, we looked at, you know, does yesterday's diffusion predict today's coping, controlling for yesterday's stress and self-efficacy appraisals and yesterday's coping? Um, so this is my go at representing this, uh, and yeah, it's, it's pretty simple basically, um, right out to time 20. Um, so <coughs> um, what did we find? So with avoidance coping, um, so you've got lagged avoidance, so yesterday's avoidance, um, the condition, because we had to control for the effects for the RCT, um, and uh, <coughs> uh, yesterday's diffusion, stress, and self-efficacy, and there was a significant um, negative association between yesterday's diffusion and um, today's avoidance coping, controlling for the stress and self-efficacy appraisals. Um, so um, I guess that was uh, interesting. Um, and I guess interestingly as well, like self-efficacy is generally a very strong predictor of um, avoidance and approach coping. And to see that, I guess, um, when you include yesterday's diffusion and stress in there, that 
that there was, there was no longer a significant relationship um, <clears throat> between self-efficacy and avoidance. Um, so it's a small, obviously, effect size, um, but... Um, we don't know what the effect size is, though, right? Because these aren't standard No. So do we have an idea of what the effect size mm, is? I, I haven't um, calculated standardised... Um, it is. Interesting dilemma to cope with because the multi-level effect sizes. Uh, I don't think there's any clear uh, consensus on how to define them. Okay. Mm. All right. Um, okay. So. Um, so make sure you finish that by the end of your PhD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, that's yeah. Standardized, <coughs> we, get, we get an, a sense of relative importance of those variables. Mm. So we may not, still not have an idea of what that effect is in the real world or in the yep. absolute sense, yep. but we would know relative to mm -hmm. lag self-efficacy, how is lag stress performing, lag diffusion. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have that sense here too, but it's a little clearer and standardized. Yeah, in terms of comparing them, I see, yeah, yeah. Okay, so then um, uh, in terms of um, the, other, the other part was, uh, that I was interested in was um, in approach coping. So for the approach coping analysis, it was a little bit more complicated because the way we measured approach coping in these daily diaries uh, measures was um, in terms of efforts to resolve a situation, like I tried to resolve today's most stressful situation, but there's plenty of evidence that if you've got bad news that you can't change, trying to resolve it isn't very adaptive. So you want to also measure the ability to which you were able to control today's most stressful situation, such that in situations where you are able to control it, then a person is more likely to, to display approach forms of coping. So um, <clears throat> basically to try and sort of deal with that, um, I uh, in, in, basically included an interaction between yesterday's cognitive diffusion and today's level of event control, predicting today's uh, approach coping. Controlling for yesterday's approach coping and yesterday's stress and self-efficacy. Okay. So, yeah. Why would it be control two rather than control one? Would be interacting. Um, well, just because, like, I just thought that my reasoning was that um, how you're going to respond to today's most stressful situation is a function of how much control you have today. So it's, it's, it's relevant to today's stressful event. It's sort of like a way of contextualising the measure of coping today. That's how I think about it. But then you get caught in the uh, dilemma of assuming a causal ordering that uh, doesn't work in terms of time. Because uh, okay. you're assuming that your time to control affects coping, whereas coping may well affect uh, the control. Yeah. So you use the time one control. I mean, mm. time one control but at least it would make mm. the temporal ordering clean. Mm, that's a really good point. I guess, yeah, the, the simple reason that I did it this way was just because um, I th thought, yeah, that, that today's level of control <coughs> is going to relate to today's coping strategy and it may, may not. But it's almost like a, you, you're trying to stratify to say that, you know, there's some events that have happened, like the person that said, my friend died, for which whatever happened yesterday just is completely irrelevant. Yeah. Um, yeah. So exactly. Words, there's almost it's almost like a threshold model. There's a threshold beyond which yesterday matters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Or like if yesterday it was my friend died. Yeah. You know, yesterday it was that you know the cat spilt the milk, and today it was my friend died. Well, I can definitely control yesterday, but I definitely can't control today. But I, it's a really good point. Like that, I mean, that's obviously the purpose of having the lag model is to deal with that issue. And so, something to think about. Um, yeah, Joseph and I have had all sorts of interesting discussions about this issue of causal ordering. It's a real tricky one. Yeah. 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 
I mean, do you have a sense of what the right answer in this scenario would be? Or? Uh, statistically clear, but uh, substantively, maybe not. Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. And, and so that's so the. You're bringing up two different issues. And yeah. They all don't always go together. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're quite different. They're quite different questions. I mean, if it's a case that they're trying to get a threshold type idea to say, you know what? <coughs> yesterday only matters if the event today is controlled. Then it's clear that that's substantively correct. Mm. Um, well, there's also an issue as to whether controllability, I don't even know how it's measured, but is controllability a trait or is it uh, uh, not a trait? A state. State. Well, I mean, you, you, almost never can you can, uh, distinguish between the two. There's almost everything that we look at is a bit state and a bit trait. Uh, could be if it was trait. Uh, that then then my then the time one would be appropriate. Mm. The state then it becomes yeah. uh, less clear. I think it's definitely more state, so yeah. Maybe maybe this is the way to do it. Uh, yeah. See what yeah, yep, yep. Um, okay, anyway, this was the, this was the, it's a bit ugly, but, um, so this is the interaction here between diff yesterday's diffusion and today's level of control, um, controlling for all that other stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, that was interesting. And when, when we didn't, when, when I just regressed yesterday's diffusion on today's approach coping, it was non-significant. So it kind of, I guess, makes sense. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is kind of representing it visually. Um, so basically what it's suggesting, I think, um, is that diffusion might help you become more context sensitive, more kind of aware of when it makes sense to try and approach. Like, for example, people who are very low, the bottom black line, in uh, event control, the more diffused you become, the less likely you are to approach COPE. Um, um, versus if you're very high on event control, the more diffused you are, the more likely you are to um, engage in approach coping. Um, so, you know, it's not, not as strong as an effect as perhaps would have liked, but I guess it's suggestive um, of, um, of, of that. Of that. Um, so anyway, that was basically the results of these two field studies. Um, and then I'll quickly walk you through a lab study that I did um, to kind of look more at, at the question of, well, can a mindfulness intervention enhance coping um, responses to stress? Um, and I'm only aware of four studies that, that have looked at this, and basically they're split down the middle in terms of effects. Um, and the last paper that looked at this in 2012 and didn't find an effect concluded that maybe a certain threshold of perceived stress is needed before mindfulness actually impacts coping. I searched through these four studies and none of them measured stress or even anxiety or anything like that. So um, <clears throat> the question then was, well, yeah, maybe, maybe you know, when you're not that stressed, well, you don't really need mindfulness. You're coping just fine, thank you very much. Uh, but as, as your stress levels increase, the stakes increase, you kind of, it makes a difference. Um, and um, <clears throat> in this study, we, uh, we measured mindfulness in, we operationalised mindfulness in two ways. One was using diffusion, a diffusion induction, um, and then the second was an acceptance induction. And we kind of thought that these two are probably our best bet in terms of influencing how a person's going to cope with a stressful situation. Um, probably more than being in the present moment and more than self as contact text. Um, but you know, obviously you've got limited number of um, conditions in, in, in you can um, include. Um, <clears throat> so what we did, we had two, again, just for some reason the numbers are the same, 200 Australian undergraduate students um, and we, we gave them, we randomly allocated them to four conditions. So we had acceptance and diffusion. 
And then we <coughs> included a self-affirmation induction. And there's a fair bit of evidence that self-affirmation, even just writing about you know, an important aspect of your life that's important to you, can turn around a person's um, sort of threat response and defensiveness and, and avoidance coping responses. So we, we kind of thought of this as a bit of a treatment as usual. Um, comparison and then a relaxation um, as an active control for the mindfulness uh, inductions. And then basically we did a, um, with the students to kind of um, create the experience of stress, we gave them a cognitive abilities test. And we all know how attached students are to their cognitive abilities. Um, we couldn't call it an IQ test because it wasn't one of the official IQ tests, but um, <clears throat> we took some sort of Mensa problems that were really, really tough. And we basically, um, uh, students did this and then they got a deflated score and they were told that they were below the student average on this test. Okay. So it was a bit sort of brutal. Um, um, and then to make it even worse, this is just the beginning, then in the, in the lab session we, we basically asked people to report their score to two peers. Um, and then we're going to match them up with people who got a similar score and then they kind of debrief where they did well and where they could improve and this kind of thing. So it was on like this, it was on the screen and we used an interface tool where you, where you kind of live typed your score. But we said, if you don't want to kind of, you know, report your score, no one's going to know if you kind of, if, if, if you kind of just quietly inflated a bit. So we gave them the option and, um, but kind of emphasised the costs of doing that. So these became our measures of coping. So this is adapted from a self-theory study that uh, James referenced a couple of weeks ago, Mueller and Dweck, where um, <clears throat> this sort of reporting um, your, your score to peers. So um, if a student lied about their score in this um, procedure, that was deemed avoidance coping, um, a way of avoiding, um, I guess, disclosing that you'd done badly on something. Um, and then we also asked them um, if they were interested in taking a remedial tutorial. Um, and those that volunteered indicated, yes, I'd like to take a remedial tutorial to improve my cognitive abilities. We um, basically took, used that as a measure of approach coping. Um, and so basically the, the question is very simple. Um, do our mindfulness inductions predict coping responses following this experience? Um, and what we found was, um, just take the left-hand panel to start with, um, you know, you can see that, <clears throat> so this was their event-related stress. We asked them just to rate how stressful they found this whole experience um, prior to doing the induction. Um, and um, you can see there's kind of a clear negative association between how stressed, um, stressful they stress they felt and their approach coping, um, but <clears throat> there were some interesting differences between the conditions such that if you're in the acceptance group, which is the sort of thick dotted line that runs sort of flat across there, that <clears throat> um, as, your, as people's stress levels increased, they were no more likely to engage in, sorry, less likely to engage in approach coping. Um, Interestingly, the diffusion induction um, kind of followed the sort of normal uh, trend, as did self-affirmation and relaxation. And on the other side, we have their avoid the measure of avoidance. So, like this is just a proportion of from zero to one of um, <clears throat> uh, people in each condition that um, that um, chose to lie about their their score um, and. Again, you can see those in the, there's a significant um, uh, interaction effect there between being in the acceptance condition um, and uh, diffusion and relaxation. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so that was looking at um, event related stress. Then we also checked, like, what about people who are just stressed in general? So we we looked at um, per people's perceived monthly stress, um, you know, on the assumption that for a person that's really struggling at the moment, faced with some really kind of annoying task like this, they're going to be much less likely to, to want to approach and more likely to avoid. Um, and again, there's kind of a, a negative association there between stress and approach and a positive between um, stress and avoidance. 
But again, we found these interesting um, uh, moderation effects. So again, if you're in the acceptance condition, it kind of acted as a buffer um, uh, as, your, for, as people progressively became uh, more stressed, uh, reported higher levels of monthly stress. <clears throat> um, and for the avoidance uh, coping, um, the X from there was, I think there was actually none of those were significant interactions, but there was a significant conditional effect um, above a certain um, am amount of monthly stress. There were significant differences between acceptance and, um, <coughs> and relaxation. Um, Sorry. That is, yeah. That is the acceptance line in the avoidance coping? Is it different from zero? Is the simple slope for acceptance in the avoidance coping panel is that slope different from zero? Um, yes. Um, yes, I think it is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're still you're still more likely to avoid even in the acceptance condition as your stress increases. I'm, I'm curious about the bits on the left with the low stress. I mean, I can understand the high stress. Yeah. But uh, I, I wonder if that's an artifact of only looking at linear trends. Uh, so that the, you know, you got to have a straight line. And actually, if you will, uh, if you were looking at the actual means or a polynomial or something like that, that they would all mm. collapse on the left hand side, because isn't that what you would normally expect? Mm, mm. That there would it is be much different, different yeah. when the stress level is zero or yeah. sufficiently low, mm. that it doesn't make much difference? Maybe not. Yeah. Are you predicting differences on the left hand side? No. Um, That's a really good point. <coughs> on the right hand side, it can't go below zero. So yeah, it's uh, just a, it's just a... It's an artifact for sure there. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a, 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 a regression line through the, um, the data. So um, that, that can make acceptance look either like a really good thing or a terrible thing. Like, so if they all collapse, then approach is uh, sorry, acceptance is awesome because they keep doing the right thing the whole way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if it is the way it is there, then it suggests that if you have acceptance, then you are just you just can't adjust what you're doing to the environment. You just like, yeah. or you, you just, just stupidly care. stay with the same strategy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't hear it mm. right. Is there a way to test? I mean, can we put a polynomial there? Or, or like, yeah, I haven't, <laughs> haven't, <laughs> haven't, haven't tried. But, um, yeah, um, yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. Uh, something to something to to check out. Yeah, it would be an easier story. Mm hmm Yeah. Coming to confusion isn't doing so well. No, and mindful. Yeah. <laughs> According to your previous Yes, that's right. And so the reason that we think that it didn't sort of do very well in, in this study is because of the induction. Um, like it was just so the induction we used comes from act and it's called leaves on a stream. And basically you're asked to visualize like a stream and you know think of this situation that you're in you know being faced with a stressful situation in a, in a class and then each time you have a thought you place it on a stream and watch it go down and I mean it, I, I think for a lot of people it would have seen it as being a bit sort of a bit kooky you know like it, it, it's just a bit weird and it could have probably ended up um, having the opposite effect that it makes them more in their head about it like god this is weird or what the hell is he you know I mean, we, we tried to contextualize it but that's um that's what i that's my kind of punch is that that's um possibly like yeah what was happening um but uh fortunately no way of knowing <laughs> yep time to wrap it up um Oh, okay, sure. Um, well, yeah, uh, this is pretty much it anyway. So this is the last slide. So, um, yeah, that um, cognitive diffusion predicted... This is just a summary of the findings, basically. Um, and I think Baljinder's question then was just, you know, well, why, why did the diffusion sort of not seem to do anything in, this, in, the, in the lab study? And I was just saying that I think it was because of the actual induction that we used that would have been a bit hard for people to engage with. That's, that's what I think. 
Um, so yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. Um, so yeah, thank thank you. Um, I'm kind of bothered by the uh, the fact that initially you showed uh, uh, some situation where uh, avoidance coping was quite appropriate. <laughs> now, if you, if that bullfighter was going to use approach, <laughs> and he'd be dead. <laughs> and, and so uh, somehow or another, the need for flexibility mm. in coping doesn't seem to come out of this. Yeah. You're, you're sort of saying, it's sort of like you're saying approach is good and avoidance is bad. I think in the, I think in the, um, in the second um, study I showed with the, the, moder the moderation effect, um, the sort of contextual effect. I think that shows that. Um, <clears throat> and I guess in, um, in this lab study, I mean, it was just, a, it was just one task, bang. Um, uh, yeah, but I mean, maybe for some, people, for some people, it would have been the best thing to avoid because you know, you're really stressed and you just can't deal with, handle it. Um, so maybe it would have been a, a, an adaptive decision to avoid. Um, Interesting yes. to set up an experiment whereby, you know, it was likely that avoidance coping would be most effective for this particular site of situation, and then approach might be for the other. I, I haven't seen. Yeah, that. I've read that literature. And then and then see if mindfulness helps a person to yeah. kind of yeah choose which choose that. More yeah, or maybe it's effective in some situations. Yes. We were looking yeah. at a <coughs> causal ordering study where we had an interaction term in each wave. And yeah. Maybe that's maybe that would get at now, but it was real messy and it was almost impossible to interpret. So I, I'm not sure whether interaction effect an interaction effect is sort of saying that uh, uh, somebody that can be high on both is a lot better than somebody who's low on both. And I don't know about your mm. your premise about the bowl or because. I think I think I think Paul's just going to make a comment oh, as well. I completely agree with everything you just said just then, but James, would you say that the coping literature as a whole has also said that approach is better than avoidance? Yeah, I mean, there's there've been like several big meta-analyses done that have shown that you know over the long term approach is definitely more adaptive than avoidance, but it's this thing about in the context and you know in the last probably five years there have been several papers that have developed um, measures of coping flexibility, which I think is kind of what you're getting at and and I yeah would have it would have been good to have looked at that. Yeah, you could also argue in this particular instance that lying about your score, well, I don't know, generally speaking I wouldn't have thought lying was a, a great strategy, although you did make the case that if you're already overwhelmed, maybe it's hard. No, 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 I wasn't talking about in a particular instance, I was just talking about from a big picture that somehow or another there's this uh, approach bias. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's in the coping literature. Yeah. But bearing in mind that that was exactly how we operationalized approach and avoidance. Uh, avoidance in that case is <coughs> to improving your performance on the cognitive ability test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. I, I got it, I got it. But like uh, what Chris said would be interesting to in fact, yeah. be yeah. probably a, a highly cited publication yeah. uh, and fairly easy to do to say that uh, approaches sometimes bad. Well, yeah. if I can just say, one of the things I think James and I both learned in this whole process is that the distinction between approach and avoidance is really fuzzy, like, and it's actually really hard to tie down. The way that people stick them in different boxes is, seems to me to be pretty arbitrary. People just say, oh, that's approach, that's avoidance, you know. So that I'm, I, having done all this, <laughs> having you having done it all, it's, it's, a, it's probably not a point that we would start again, is it? Using that distinction. Yeah. And the coping literature is a wee history too, doesn't it? I mean, even Lazarus and Folkman kind of started off by talking about it as being really contextual and yep. kind of didn't test it that way. And then there was a stage where everybody said it was just contextual, and then there was a stage where everyone said it was personality. personality. Right? Yeah. So it's, 
It's a bit of a mess, to, to be honest, yeah, yeah. There's one set of definitions that distinguishes between avoidance as diminishing the negative affect and approach as solving the problem, I think. So how is the problem? Yeah. Is that that's, right. that's right. Essentially, so. Because I've seen distinctions where they talk about task, task mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. coping, yep. coping, yep. and then avoidance coping. Yep. That's sort of three types. It's another I was classification. Kind of to see that you had the approach yep. instead of including both the task and the emotion together. Yeah, or emotion might kind of get split down the middle depending on, on whether it's as a way of venting and avoiding or whether it's a way of like figuring yeah. it out and getting some help. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so. James, ask question. Yep. Um, I've seen some, some studies with these data studies that uh, come up with a way of tracking the variability of the measure. And so um, that might tie into uh, this idea about yeah. whether there's variability in the code. Yeah. So we've kind of talked, a, we've kind of thought a bit about that, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, so um, the. The, the guy that came and gave the, the um, multi-level modelling course here from the UK, um, George, yeah, he, he kind of, um, it was a paper that, uh, um, where, that, where that's been done. Um, so, yeah, just, but it would be interesting. I think one of the... <laughs> okay, yeah. But I, I think the problem with this, though, is we've got a five-point Likert scale and single-item measures. So how much variability are you really getting? Um, it just looks like, it, yeah, I don't know. It, I, I think that might be a, a hurt, an obstacle. But you've got measures in relation to 20 different events. Yeah. So uh, in that one, you should be able to get a measure of variability that's mm. meaningful. Mm. Uh, because if you've got 20 different events, mm. at least some of them should be ones where it might be appropriate to avoid. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think we, we didn't, we don't, uh, well, I, have to th I don't know. It's, it's good to, th I don't know, just think about it more and, <clears throat> um, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. You put yourself up and yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah. It might just get slightly closer to some of the things you Like what I, what I thought would be interesting to see is whether over time people had more variability in their coping, for example. Like that, that might be interesting to see, but just looking at the data, it's just a... There's, there's just no, just look this eyeball in the data that, that didn't seem to be the case. The models are quite complex, aren't they? I mean, because essentially you're extracting the population trend. Mm -hmm. Step one. Step two, you pull out each individual's trend. Mm -hmm. And then you're left with the residual variation that you then predict with something else. So it's, it's not. It's not sure. Exactly but, you, but you could also, you could also just look at the variability over time of the coping strategy. Uh, I mean, sure, but I suppose what Rob's talking about is what you want to be able to do you know, is to be able to say, if somebody's level of avoidance coping jumps up beyond the population and their own individual trend, and these aren't held in bearing. <coughs> I guess I was just, does, looking, I was just does, looking at somebody that's uh, uh, able to use both over time is going to be uh, uh, is going to be have some advantages over somebody that always uses that's one. That's right. It just shows, it shows flexibility or something, even maybe across days. If mm. you do variability for, you know, from day one to day two or day four. Mm. So okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. Well. Um, <laughs> no, we're out of time, so yeah. Um.